or when they are recovering, when they are recovering from um, COVID-19 infection. And today I am glad we've got three esteemed panelists uh, who I will introduce one at a time. Uh, so our first presenter is going to be Dr. Felix Moniruke. He is a pulmonal, pulmon <laughs> he's a respiratory physician working in Arare uh, and he's going to talk to us about his experiences, professional and personal um, in, the, uh, in recovering from post COVID-19 syndrome. Okay, Dr. Manyeruke, please, you can begin. Good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Uh, my name is uh, Felix Manyeruke. I'm a specialist uh, pulmonologist currently working in Arari. Um, so I'm going to just give a brief uh, story of how I, I experienced COVID and how I suffered from it. So basically, I'm, I've been working in COVID since 2020. Uh, basically, I've worked in both uh, COVID units and the post COVID units. So everything had been, uh, I mean, been, it's been it's been a year since I've been I've, I've been working in this COVID unit. We were setting up a COVID uh, post COVID clinic in Cape Town where I was training, I was doing pulmonary training. When I got infected with COVID, I got infected with COVID sometime early January 2021. And um, when I got infected with COVID, it was basically me and my whole family, me and my wife and my two kids. We had COVID. We isolated at home for 14 days. It was very uneventful. Uh, I had with minor symptoms, a bit of a, a cough, fever, myalgia, but very uneventful. My problem started when I went back to work in uh, after two weeks of isolation. That time, my problem was mainly fatigue. So I had fatigue, uh, both uh, physical fatigue, muscle fatigue, and also mental fatigue. The poor concentration, and also had, uh, anxiety, and fear that you have when you're going back to work in a COVID unit after you've had a bout of COVID really uh, uh, hits you in the face that I mean, you're going to be going back to the work, same work environment that you, that you had when you had the disease. Also a bit of uh, insomnia. And I mean, all this didn't, didn't wasn't looking well for me. I mean, I, was, I had to go back to work and I had to prepare for exams in March and I had these symptoms. And these symptoms persisted with me for about uh, for the next six months, what really troubled me was the fatigue. My the chronic cough, I had a backing cough with, with uh, worsening of my allergic rhinitis. And uh, during this process, I mean, we were just starting a, a, a in the, we, we were in the midst of starting a post COVID lung clinic. In this clinic, we had lots of patients. We had been admitted to ICU and uh, had been on medical cough ventilation, high flow. These patients had multiple uh, uh, symptoms from patients with uh, chronic cough, chronic fatigue. A patient with chronic lung diseases from uh, a, a, a lung fibrosis, a organized pneumonia, some were still auto dependent after spending about 60, 60 to 70 days in the hospital, they were still auto dependent. And uh, we had also had a couple of patients with chronic fatigue uh, uh, syndrome, anxiety disorders, and trying to deal with uh, trying to, to deal with this disease yourself, and you are also trying to uh, help patients who are also suffering from the same disease. I mean, what you tend to realize is that as a doctor, you are no, you are, you are also a mortal. So you can you can be a doctor and try to help patients, but you're also a doctor who can also uh, fall sick. So you are sick and you're also trying to help patients. And what what you what you learn from this experience is that you need to learn to empathize with your uh, with your patients. So you, you really learn empathy from uh, <laughs> from the ground up because you you are also a patient. So what they describe to you is what exactly you are feeling. You're trying to help them go through this this disease, and what you what really is troubling about this disease is there's a lot of uncertainty. You don't know what's going to happen to you. You don't know whether you're going to uh, recover fully, and you're trying to read about what is what other people have experienced. And there's very little information on uh, on the uh, the evolution of COVID. You don't really know what's going to happen. You look at other viruses like the previous uh, 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 SARS infection in 20, 2010. With patients, patients have had persistent uh, fatigue, tenuous on the line, patients have had persistent uh, e e e anxiety disorders after the, 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 the initial phase of uh, the, the initial e illness. Look at the other viral illnesses like adenovirus, which tend to give you a, a, a bronchiolitis picture, other viral patients like measles, which can give you a, a sort of like a bronchiectasis picture. So all these things give you anxiety and, and you, you realize that you're in the same body as your patients. 
and you try to uh, figure yourself out while you're trying to also help other people out. And sometimes it gives you lots of, um, it's quite difficult to go through it. But as you go through this illness, you realize that this is where you are. And the only thing you can do is to move on from that point. So what you tend to realize is that he, despite having this disease, you, you have to accept where you are and move on from, uh, from that point. So moving on, moving on is uh, something that's going to happen a step at a time. So it's also like um, you need to make small changes to your life and you have to move on with that uh, fatigue that you have. So during the time, I mean, he, 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 what you tend to do is try to make small changes that, that, might, that will get you back, back, back to the most functional position that you can be from the uh, point that you are at. And one thing that really helps is uh, having colleagues to debrief with. So at that time, I had my colleague Edson in Cape Town, whom I was working with. So debriefing with uh, Edson, debriefing in large group, uh, large group meetings in, in our respiratory unit was also very helpful. So we had debriefing uh, periods whereby we talked about our experience uh, with chronic fatigue, both from, uh, I mean, a number of us had COVID at the time. So discussing about our, our symptoms, discussing about how to deal with fatigue, uh, and uh, bend out, bend out as, as, uh, as doctors working in a COVID unit whereby at the time the numbers were going up and there was no sign that this day, the, because during the Delta wave, the Delta wave was going to go down. And you had to both, both, both work with patients with COVID, patients with post-COVID symptoms and deal with your own uh, symptoms. So, I mean, this was a quite a pressing period, uh, pressing period, but deep living with colleagues was very helpful. You, you learn that, I mean, being a doctor doesn't make you, uh, doesn't make you uh, uh, immune to illness. And it's also good as a fine line worker when it comes to infectious disease, makes you prone to getting those diseases. And that you must learn to, first of, first of all, live a, a health lifestyle, learn to protect yourself, and also learn to uh, rely on your colleagues to when, when, you are, when, you are, when, you are, when you're suffering from this disease. And this, opens up a new avenue that, I mean, being a doctor and being a patient helps you understand how these patients suffer, how they experience chronic disease, what they mean when they say that I've got chronic fatigue. I can't, I, 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 can't, I mean, despite having a normal oxygen level, I can't seem to be able to, to do much during the day. And how, I mean, challenges is, is, the major challenge when, when dealing with um, post-COVID lung disease is the uncertainty, you don't really know how you're going to move on from where you are right, right now. And you don't really, and it's really challenging to understand the, uh, the, 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 the cost of the disease because no one knows how it's going to progress, how it's going to move on. But what's very useful during the time is you, you learn that, uh, you learn to understand what patients mean when they tell you that I'm suffering from this. And these are my experiences. These are, this is what's, this is what's troubling me. And you also learn to understand that chronic disease doesn't only affect your patient, it also affects your, your, your the patient's relatives. Because I mean, this, when, when, when COVID affects you, it doesn't only affect you, it affects those people that you're living with. That fatigue that you have also affects the way you interact with other people. And debriefing with colleagues, debriefing with, the, with your wife, telling them, understanding what you're experiencing now, they are also dealing with their symptoms. They hope you understand, they hope you move on. And other than the, the value of relationships in your work space at home and how that will impact you and help you move on from where you are. I mean, during the time I also had a, did the lung function test. I, I dropped about 600 mules from my baseline. My lung function was still normal, but I dropped by 600 mules. That's quite significant. I mean, normally I should be losing about 20 mules a year and then I dropped by about 600 mules. So then that's the anxiety that you get from uh, such changes really, uh, really, it really strikes you. But you learn that, I mean, even when you have uh, mental fatigue, physical fatigue, it, you need to learn to adapt, make small changes to your life and uh, try to, uh, to move on. So, I mean, some small changes that you try to do is develop uh, different starting techniques, which, 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 which are going, going to suit that, uh, the type of fatigue that you have, try to do, I mean, reading for an hour, resting, try different approaches uh, to, 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 to reading, trying more of uh, e, 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 
e audiovisual stimulation, listening to uh, to lectures, listening to to to, to, to tutorials rather than a uh, 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 reading the books. So you, you learn to adapt to that uh, to those uh, uh, changes that that are happening to your body. I mean, I'm lucky that I had managed to regain my lung function back to normal after about six months of this illness. And I'm lucky that, I mean, most of my symptoms have uh, subsided, but I know that I've known it, I've known it and I've known, I've known about it. And I know that I've got lots of patients who are still suffering from this post-COVID fatigue syndrome. And I've got lots of uh, colleagues who are still battling with these uh, persistent symptoms, which include this uh, fatigue, uh, this, this fatigue, this mental foggy, this uh, anxiety issue, difficulty going back to work because uh, because every time you, you you leave the house, every time you go and uh, back in that work environment, you you tend to to feel yourself you feel like you are you're in a closed uh, closed environment and you you sort of like suffocating. So I mean, you you learn empathy from the ground up. And you learn to that I mean that you, you, you are immortal and you have to uh, rely on other people. You have to take care of yourself. You need to uh, you take care of yourself. Take some time out when you when you when you are feeling bent out. You need to learn that you need to uh, rely on your uh, your colleagues. You need to uh, take a step back and rest sometimes if you are fatigued. So those are some of the lessons that I got from COVID. I mean, I've learned how to empathize with my patients, how to explain to them what is unknown in medicine and what's known and how we can uh, move on from where we are at and how to, to deal with uh, the various challenges that we're having when, 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 when you're suffering. I mean, the most important thing that I've learned is that you need to know where you are right now. And you need to uh, realize that, that is, this is where you are. I mean, acceptance is, acceptance is the first step that you need to, 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 to make. And then from there onwards, Move on and uh, face this. Uh, face face the uh, changes that are happening to your body. And try to live with them and adapt to them. So that's my experience with COVID, and this how I faced it, and this uh, this what has kept me going. Okay, thank you. Great! Wow, thank you so much, Doctor Manyerke. Um, thank you for being in the front line and actually fighting this this pandemic. Um, in the front lines, in the trenches, but also I want to say thank you for actually volunteering to tell us about your experience, your personal experience, rather than the professional or academic uh, experience of treating COVID, but living with COVID. Um, at this point, I'd like to ask people in the audience, do you have questions or comments for Dr. Manyeruke? Any any questions for to ask um, Felix or comments? Well, personally, I'd like to I'd like to get uh, other I would like to hear from other colleagues what they what they experienced uh, uh, when 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 they had COVID, what they experienced uh, when they are dealing with patients with COVID, how they have managed to uh, move on from from this disease. What what has been their experience? What symptoms have they have to fight? fighter uh, and how they've managed to uh, integrate this into their uh, daily lives and how it has helped them grow professionally and help them uh, continue going. Uh, while we wait for volunteers, um, maybe I can tell you about uh, another second-hand experience. Um, a colleague of mine had severe COVID and ended up in hospital. And he did also suffer from fatigue afterwards. So we've been looking around at uh, fatigue as a common symptom in health workers. And actually 30 to 40% of health workers in the recovery period from COVID uh, are suffering from fatigue. Uh, insomnia is another very big uh, symptom that's happening in the post COVID syndrome. Um, how my colleague in mental health um, recovered basically is what you are describing that it's a day at a time. There is no one hard and fast answer. He 
uh, did a few debriefs with the psychologist. Uh, he had the luxury of one-to-one, -one, I guess, because of where he works, but also um, a graded return to activity, right? So I find with COVID, when the test comes back never in the early days when we used to use negative tests, when once you're negative, you're told, get on with it, right? Uh, because you're negative, you should be okay. Uh, but actually in the post COVID syndrome, it's not just get on with it. People need to stagger their return to activity. Uh, some, some of their duties, they may need to allow other people to take on those activities, those responsibilities, uh, and slowly build themselves back up to uh, their full function. You know, um, that's my, my take on it. I don't know, colleagues, anyone else with a comment? You can raise your hand uh, or put something in the chat. Hi, Michelle. Oh, there are some questions. Mm -hmm. So there are some questions in there. Uh, okay. Yes. So, Doc, uh, Dr. Felix, one of our um, panelists is asking, does pulmonology recommend any breathing exercises for helping with improving lung function post-infection? So, so we, we, do, we do recommend uh, breathing exercises. Uh, I think there's Vlad like, Naya's... Uh, 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 that's his specialty. He can tell you about breathing exercises and uh, it's, it's spirometry and other things that they do to help improve uh, mm -hmm. lung function and just general function in patients with chronic okay. illness is a COVID lung disease, in post COVID lung disease. So we, we do recommend breathing exercises. And lots of our patients uh, find this very useful. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, another question is so. Did you share with your patients about the symptoms you were having when you returned to work? So, so I think the, I think it depends. I mean, we take each patient as they come. So some patients, are, I mean, we've got a variety of patients. We've got patients with um, situations of 88 who are going back, who are going about their normal business. We're trying to move on from there. So they are doing well, and they they don't they, they don't have any they don't. They're not suffering from much, but they're not suffering from debilitating fatigue. But then you've got some patients who've got saturations of 95, 96, and they are lying in bed and they're unable to, um, to, 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 to go on about their usual day. So some patients like those ones, those you have got to share with them and they need, they need you to tell them, to reach to them, and that personal level, tell them that, I mean, I mean, this, you're not alone in this disease. We, we've all suffered from it. We've all had fatigue, we've all had anxiety, we've suffered from anxiety, the fear of going back to work and, and uh, the persistence of these symptoms. And sometimes you have got to share that personal experience with your the patient so that they see that they are not, in their, they are not on, their, on their own. So I do share with, share with some of my patients, but uh, not all of them. I mean, they, so this is basically just an answer to that. No, okay, all right. Um, I had a question, Doc, on the debriefing sessions. Were they mandated for everyone who's recovering from COVID, or it's only it's only those people who volunteered for them? So debriefing periods um, in Cape Town, I think um, they weren't really mandated, but you were encouraged to 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 to, to go for uh, for debriefing uh, sessions. So you were encouraged. Do you have deep briefing? So we had deep briefings after you've suffered from COVID. You had deep briefings to deal with the uh, chronic uh, uh, e e fatigue, uh, burnout while you're working in the COVID unit. So we had two special sets of deep briefings, and okay. uh, so I mean they were not mandated, but it's something that's uh, that, that that's encouraged among all the healthcare workers. Okay. It helps. Uh, it helps you just uh, let out everything that's affecting you and helps you just uh, move on. Okay. So through your work day, you were actually given time to attend these sessions? They were done on Zoom. <laughs> so most of the debriefing was done on Zoom. Yes, uh, but it was, there was protected time to allow protected. you to attend. 
Yes, yes. There was, there was a set term which allowed you to attend the fifth. Okay. So, All right. So, yeah. So there were some terms. Okay. That's and um, somebody else has a question, Doc. That how did you feel becoming the patient? <laughs> how was that? Um, changing you're changing the side of the table you were sitting on. How was it? So it's. it's, it's it's not a very good experience. I mean, you 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 realize that I mean that you 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 used to 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 be in the driver's seat, so you you feel helpless. I mean, in a patient, I mean, when you're used to being a doctor, but you realize that it's, it's a necessary thing that has to happen. You need to ask for help. You need to ask. You, have to, you need to have someone helping you when you when you when you when you're sick. So it, I mean, most of, I mean, I've I've never really visited a doctor previously. I mean, but when I was sick, when I Post COVID syndrome, I had to visit my colleagues. I need to, I needed their help. I needed to, 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 I needed them to assist me when I when I was when I was down. So it's mm -hmm. something that's necessary. I mean, but it's not, it's not, a, it's not something that you, something that you realize that you have to, you have to realize that you, being a doctor, you're also a mortal, and you need to have your hope. And there are people out there to help you, and the hope, the hope is something that you you only get if you ask for. So there's something that. Really. Asking for help, very important, um, because less than a third of health workers are actually asking for help, right? 50% of them are getting post-COVID syndrome, but less than 30% are actually reaching out. So thank you for saying that, doctor, that we need to, at some point, de-roll and accept help from our, our colleagues. Then the very last question from your chat box is, did you feel listened to as a patient with, with doctors and your healthcare team believing your symptoms uh, when you reported them? Well, <laughs> that's a hard one. <laughs> oh, your colleagues are here. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. So it's okay. a hard one, I mean, what, I mean, one of the things that you, that, that, that you realize is that this, this is me, and these are my symptoms. I mean, you, I, I mean, the thing, that, the thing that you will understand is you, you, you always feel like they're not listening. That's the thing. I mean, you're not really understanding what I'm telling you that I'm suffering from this, and what you, and what you, what, what they tend to, what, what you feel that uh, you feel the doctors are sort of like brushing up, brushing your symptoms. Or what they were trying to do is just do yes, a quick deep breath and get you back to the. Mm -hmm. to, 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 I mean, this 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 how you feel sometimes. I mean, but yeah, I guess I mean it's it's, it's a hard experience to, to to describe. But it's 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 helpful in its way. But sometimes you feel that it's it is because it's only inadequacy. I mean, deep briefing with colleagues, it's a good thing. But there's there's also inadequacy. There are other things that you have to fill in by yourself. There are other other things that you need to continue doing for you to get back to where you are. But it's hard. I mean, this being recent is quite. Quite hard to, to to understand. I mean, my symptoms are my own, and suffering from them is a personal experience. Hard to describe them. Yeah. Hard to yeah. get someone yeah. to listen to. So that's that's mm -hmm. the way. I... Okay, I know I'd say the last question, but I can't resist this one because I've also been researching it. Someone in the events wants to know: Does vaccine reduce long COVID symptoms? Did you take? Your vaccination before, or after you had COVID. So I got I got COVID in uh, early uh, January 2021. So this was before the vaccination. So I got my vaccine after after I had COVID. So some some studies seem to suggest that the fatigue tends to to dec decrease, and then about a third of uh, people are vaccinated. So a third of patients feel better after they get vaccinated. Okay. Some there's no change. So in a small percentage, I think less than five percent or so, they put a, they get a bit of worsening of those symptoms. So okay. it's a different experience for for everyone. Majority of it, there's no change in the symptoms. A third, they improve. A small small group, there's, there's some slight worsening of the symptoms. So it's okay. hard to to. to All right. Be, yeah. Okay. Okay, Dr. Manyeruke, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure you can see in the chat box that um, your presentation has touched a lot of your colleagues. Uh, they are all very grateful for you taking the time to describe and talk to us about 
uh, recovering from uh, post-COVID syndrome, post-COVID-19 syndrome. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So now uh, we're going to move on to our next presenter, uh, Mr. Vladimir Gombakomba. He is a physiotherapist who has been working um, in helping patients recover from post-COVID-19 syndrome. So Vladimir, welcome. You can begin. Yes, hello everyone. Afternoon. Thank you, Michelle. Um, thank you, fellow panelists as well. Um, so my 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 part in uh, the question that was given by uh, Jonathan is uh, my experience uh, in dealing with uh, long COVID and uh, chronic illnesses, uh, particularly the uh, how I feel when the patients are not getting better. So it's, it's uh, the, the, the things that I'm going to address are uh, uh, partly my experiences in uh, dealing with uh, the issues that do not resolve. Um, so um, it, uh, I, was, I was called by uh, the Metro uh, in uh, 2020 to come and assist at St. AIDS, which is a COVID center. So that, that was my first experience in dealing with, uh, with COVID patients. That's why I met uh, Dr. Manieruk and other physicians and the intensivists. So uh, it, was, it was not a, a pleasant journey, uh, particularly in, in that area where uh, patients were, were not recovering. We're losing lots of patients, especially in ICU. Um, and it's not a, a, a it's not a good feeling as a healthcare professional when I when I don't get uh, a good results and I don't see my patients recover. So um, Jonathan is mostly deals with the emotions and the feelings. I, I can't really find the right word to to, to say, but I can say that our uh, it's um, uh, sad disappointment, it, uh, and uh, it just also lowers your morale. Uh, if you're not uh, getting uh, a good result, so um, with with long COVID now, the patients were discharged, and then. I would get referrals from Dr. Manieruk and others to say that, uh, uh, can you go and help this patient? Uh, so I remember going to Buroteo, I remember going to Guadana, attending to, 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 to long COVID cases. Uh, uh, the feelings mostly, uh, you know, the, the patients, they pay a lot of money for you to go to their house. And uh, when you get there, after having done, you know, breathing exercises, um, incentive spirometry, do lung, lung expansion exercises, uh, you, you know, all sorts of things that we do with to maintain pulmonary hygiene. Uh, the patients they don't get better. You feel it. It feels like you are robbing the the patient. It feels like you are. You you are just there to to look after yourself as a uh, uh, as a healthcare professional, and uh, the patient doesn't get any better. I, I I had a patient who who I saw for about six months. You know, I would go there once a week. Uh, they were not getting better, and. Uh, uh, the physician would say, uh, uh, there's nothing much we can do, just keep on doing a, a, a physiotherapy. And then I go there and uh, the patient is not getting better. It's, uh, it's not a good feeling. Uh, um, and... Uh, um, 
there's also chronic illness that we, we, we deal with. Uh, uh, low back pain, uh, neck pain. Sometimes things don't resolve. Um, this is better because we do it in a setting. There'll be in an environment in a, in a clinic where we use machines and stuff. And uh, I'm sure these patients can see that we, 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 we try to do our best because of the gadgets they help us uh, psychologically to, 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 to give up the work that we'll be doing on the patients. Uh, but still, the patient not getting better, it's not, it's not a good thing. It, um, it, uh, you, you start thinking, you start self-reflecting, what, what am I missing? Is, uh, sometimes you call other colleagues, you know, since other senior colleagues, and they say, uh, you try to, to, to ask, is there something that I can do or something that I, uh, I should be doing, or should I be referring someone? Um, yeah, but basically to answer uh, uh, the question that was, given, that was given to me for this presentation, it's, it's, it's not a good feeling. You feel like you are robbing a patient because the patient is not getting better. I think um, um, we, when, 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 when we, when we go to work, you know the most rewarding thing is when when you see your patient getting get getting better. It's it's, it's more rewarding than the the, the monetary uh, uh, value that you get from from going go, go, going to work. So that feeling, knowing that you have changed, you have touched someone's life, you have done a positive thing. You know they have low back pain. They were, they were suffering. Now their pain is reduced greatly. Uh, or if they had low insurance, you know, especially with this COVID thing, with the, 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 the symptoms that were being mentioned uh, by Dr. Manuruke, fatigue and stuff. If they have improved, you go and you sleep better. You 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 go home a happy man. Uh, so. Patients not recovering, it really affects uh, the life of a healthcare professional. It really affects, from my own experience, it is a bad thing, uh, and it uh, it does affect um, our day to day work. Um, it's um, you know when you because when we go to work, we're going to work to earn something, but then when you earn something. You know, even the way that you spend that money, knowing that your patient isn't recovered, your service isn't isn't helped really, it really uh, demoralizes. Um, so basically, that's that. I don't know if there are any questions. Thank you so much. Um, Vlad for, for that presentation. Um, it really puts a human face to the experience of providing healthcare. Uh, oftentimes we are taught to be, you know, de detached from the outcome, but in reality we are human beings. Uh, if it is any consolation, um, you know, we are, to quote one of the professors I listened to at the start of this pandemic, we are steering this ship while someone at the back is building it, right? We're already in the flood. So the, the answers we seek to make our patients get well we are not there yet, right? But the work you're doing now is going to give us answers uh, in the coming 10 months, 12 months, 18 months. Okay, so <laughs> uh, please don't feel discouraged. Please carry on providing the much needed care you are giving. Um, so I, any, I did see um, a question in the chat box, right? Someone wants to know if, if you can't offer the physical help uh, or if the physical intervention is not giving the outcome you were looking for. What else can you do um, or what else can you offer? And I think this is not just a question for Vlad. I think it's a question open to the whole meeting that 
when as practitioners we are seeing the physical intervention is not producing results, what else are we offering uh, our patients? Uh, okay, as, as physiotherapists, uh, uh, when we are in the hospital, yeah, normally uh, you guys, the doctors, uh, you come in, you write your prescription, then uh, you go. When we, when we, when, when we, when we dealing with patients uh, as physios, we spend, we tend to spend more time with the patient. Um, you know, uh, these our sessions normally they take more than 30 minutes, sometimes an hour. So you get to sort of have a deeper understanding or you have a relationship with the patient. So you, I, like now I know some of my patients by name, their children uh, and stuff like that because of the time that we spend when we, when we interact with patients. So uh, I, I, I could say, that interaction that we have, you know, we end up, it's not always that the, the 30 minutes or one hour, it's not always uh, the treatment. Sometimes it's, uh, they're sharing their life story. I've got a kid like this. Um, I've got a, a work there. This is my work setting. So it's kind of uh, sort of offering a bit of uh, sort of counseling, though we're not, uh, so much into that area, but that helps when they are talking to someone who's listening. We physiotherapists are very good listeners. We, we just listen and you you you, you take in what what they are, what they are saying. Uh, even in private practice, we have some patients who come in. You can see that they are coming in not not because of the problem, but they are just coming in to to talk to you. You know, to talk to talk about their issues. I think lady physiotherapists they, they can agree. They have patients who come in and they are just talking all sort of social and it helps them. They come out of that clinic brighter because they they are talking to someone who's just listening. I think that way. Then of course the I, I I'm a Christian. I believe in God. It also helps every time when I leave in the house. I say a prayer. God help. Uh, my patients. Oh Lord Jesus, help my patients. I think that that part also helps. Okay. I don't know if I've answered you there, Michelle. Yes, I, I think you you've gone a long way to to satisfy that question. Um, in my field, what you're describing is a tool we call the therapeutic alliance, right? Just that relationship with your care provider can be therapeutic in and of itself. All right, that's the listening you are describing. Um, and it's such a nuanced relationship because in it, we negotiate expectations as well, okay? If we know we're dealing with a post-COVID case, um, they, there needs to be some realignment of expectations with what is realistically known, okay? When, somebody is getting physio after an RTA. It's different from when you're getting physio after 70 days in ICU from COVID. Um, and that needs the patient and the therapist for probably need to negotiate a realistic outcome uh, that you're not going to be up and going in the next, after four sessions. We're going to need many, uh, but you know, you're not getting any worse. <laughs> so we'll count that as a win where ordinarily we would have wanted you, you've gone back to work. So the therapeutic alliance, renegotiating expectations are things you are bringing up. Then there's a question in the chat box. Uh, it comes up again that can physiotherapy, um, sorry, can physiotherapy on long COVID patients improve the lung function on spirometry? Can you please share your experiences? Okay, thank you. Uh, it's a good question. It does help. I think uh, that's, those are the, the, the premise of, uh, of our profession. Uh, many studies have been done, research is still going on. There are articles that come in uh, and they, they, they really show that there is uh, 
a, a, a great improvement when we administer incentive spirometry. Uh, it, there are positives that we get from uh, like lung expansion uh, and also making the work of breathing easier. With, with long COVID, breathing becomes more difficult. Um, and with physiotherapy intervention, uh, with the deep breathing exercises, um, lung expansion exercises, incentive spirometry, the work of breathing becomes easier. So there are positives that are supported by uh, research. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, great. So, Lad, my last question. Did you suffer from COVID? Thank you, Michelle. Uh, okay, yes. all right. I was diagnosed. <laughs> yeah. okay. so my, I got a, a negative uh, uh, PCR test. Mm -hmm. But then the physician would diagnose me say that you, it's still COVID. The clinical diagnosis. Okay. So after that, have you suffered from anxiety or pre-infection? Uh, uh, yes, and anxiety, yes, those days that, uh, because I didn't know what, if I'm going to leave or, 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 or why. So I would say those days I was affected, but all yeah. these long COVID symptoms, nah, no, I guess I'm just fortunate. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Because um, I ask because someone in the chat group is saying they have a patient who is suffering from severe anxiety over the possibility of a second infection. Um, and uh, they probably wanted uh, uh, us to talk around that. But let me pack that question for now. Uh, I hope that as our third presenter talks, probably we will get ideas on managing uh, that fear of reinfection. Um, so welcome to our third and last speaker. That will be Dr. Jonathan Brakash, a clinical psychologist working uh, both in Zimbabwe and uh, internationally as well. Right. Good afternoon, Jonathan. Great. And Great. Thanks, Michelle, very much. Okay, no. So this has been quite an interesting discussion because we're seeing how our identity as health workers gets affected when we have long COVID or a chronic illness. And then it makes us question, what was our identity built on in the first place? It was probably built on our achievements. It was probably built on helping others. And suddenly when we're experiencing fatigue, anxiety, depression, as our first presenter was mentioning, what happens then? So it, it comes down to what other things can you build your identity on, right? Because here we are, right? That's us. We're doing great. We're successful. We're competent. We feel really good about things in our work. And then we have long COVID or a chronic illness. And all this goes away. We find we're fatigued. We can't work a full day. And we're left with this just our essential selves. So it comes down to what can you control in your life and what you can't. And it really makes us face not putting energy into what we can't control, right? We want to control it, but if we can't, we can't. We just have to go with the flow. That's what we're left with. And often because we're so achievement oriented, our response Response to adversity is just a charter, but with, with COVID, that just makes us tired or, or with any chronic illness, it just doesn't work. And it's also important to watch what emotions come because once again, anxiety, depression have been what's described by most of the health workers who've experienced long COVID and often some chronic illnesses. So. I think if we can experience, understand that our emotions are not us, you watch them like a movie. If you grab onto them and give them energy, they become us. So the idea is, and you feel worse. So the idea is if you can, anger, helplessness, all of that, step back and just watch it. It's like a show. It's not you, it's just your emotions. 
So the key is, as Felix said, Dr. Felix said, is acceptance rather than resistance. Just accept where you are now. And in a sense, you're, you're walking a bit of a, a tightrope because on one hand, you're accepting where you are now, which reduces your stress. Because if you fight it, you create more stress for yourself. On the other hand, you also are telling yourself that you're moving toward good health. That's your goal. So ideally, what do we do to move toward good health? We have to remove obstacles to healing. We have a strong healing force inside us, but we need to remove those obstacles. So whatever we can do, whether it's resting, whether it's finding certain uh, medicines that help, whether it's petting your dog or being with loved ones, experiment. See what gives you energy and see what depletes your energy. It's um, also important that as health workers, we often have a can-do attitude toughen up. And this is what was reported when I was doing a bit of a research uh, search through the literature. And then because they're used to that, that I can do what I can do it when you can't do it, your whole identity is lost. And that's one of the biggest challenges I think for health workers is that uh, when you have long COVID or a chronic illness, your old self changes. Now, it's an opportunity to rediscover yourself, right? It's an opportunity to basically take sometimes our inflated view of ourselves and rediscover what our interests are. So for example, many doctors, for example, in the UK, what they did is they either cut down their practices or they found other interests and or they just decided they would spend more time in things that gave them energy, artistic pursuits, time with family and friends. So all these things are very, very important. I think also that because we're health workers and we're used to solutions and making people better, the helplessness we might feel when we're not getting better is really a challenge. And I think once again, we have to, have, we have to accept where we are and at the same time, move in the direction of health. So um, from, from, from the Congo, uh, I was talking to Claire Rudd, who's, who's listening now, and she was working with a mining concern and health workers there. And they were talking about fighting burnout, fatigue, depression, anxiety, and the importance of acknowledging one's feelings, and also the role of fear. And I think that's so important, like Vladimir was talking about, the fear that, am I going to die? Am I going to live? How long are my symptoms going to progress? Will they get worse? And this is something that came up again and again in all the doctor's literature and health workers' literature that I was searching for. So one was this challenge of living with prolonged symptoms. The second one was uncertain about the pathophysiology and the duration of the illness, whether it was um, cancer or chronic fatigue or long COVID. The third was the concerns over future fitness to work that Dr. Felix mentioned. And then especially the loss of professional and personal identities. Who are you? Who do you become if you've trained your whole life to become a health worker? And now you can't do it the way you want to. You get fatigued, you have trouble breathing, you may be experiencing anxiety. What happens to you? And then also the stigma associated with symptoms such as fatigue. You're supposed to be a high-performing doctor or high-performing health worker. Now you're getting fatigued. You can't even do the whole day. And what a lot of this information came out of a group called Doctors in Distress, which was formed in the UK for doctors in distress, facing long COVID especially. And what they found is that when they didn't have a diagnosis, they felt very dismissed by their colleagues. And what they've all said is that the most important thing is to be heard by their colleagues. Also, they need to say that they recognize that improvement will take time, but it means making space for self-care rather than striving to perform. And I think this is a very important one for all of us in the health field. From the loss of the old self, often a transformation happened. And once again, you know, that there's a Chinese ideogram, a Chinese letter that says the same letter for crisis is, it has the same meaning for change. It can mean change as well. So this is an opportunity you have in your life to really change yourself, change your priorities, change your focus, 
change what's important to you. And not being heard themselves, these doctors and health workers pledged to be open-minded, more open-minded, especially about symptoms that don't fit into clearly recognized patterns. And I think listening to patients, this is one of the biggest challenges that um, as Michelle was saying, we don't know the whole profile of long COVID and its impact. So often people will present with symptoms that the doctors or health workers can just scratch their head about. And finally, I think the important thing is to be kinder to yourself as a health worker if you're ill, your colleagues and other patients. And I think that's one of the most important, uh, important things we can do. It makes us more human. It makes the interaction more humanized. And when we accept vulnerability, we can also better accept the vulnerability in other patients and perhaps empathize with them, which patients are saying is the most important thing. And Dr. Michelle was also alluding to that. So when you can't cure physical illness, what do you do? So one is not saying it's all in the patient's head, because I think we have to adopt what we would call a biopsychosocial model, which is we're looking at the entirety of a person's life. So we're looking at social, we're looking at psychological, we're looking at physical. Also recognizing that we don't have tests to measure a lot of things. Um, I heard one story from a doctor here who a client had cerebral thrombosis and all the clotting parameters were normal. Right? And to think about what help and healing you can offer, whether that's reassurance, whether that's talking about your journey as one of the uh, chat room comments said, whether that's just simply allowing the client, giving them hope and acceptance that we do have a healing energy inside us. And the idea is just to create less stress and to be accepting of it in the present and to sort of do a little bit of a research study and see what gives us energy and what doesn't. And also to recognize the benefits of other disciplines, acupuncture, Chinese medicine, that traditional medicine doesn't have all the answers. And finally, um, I recommend a book called Well, W-E-L-L by Dr. Mary Gunn, which is describing her journey through incurable cancer and just how she's living with that uncertainty. And I think that's the challenge too. Life is full of uncertainty. We convince ourselves it's not, but I think having long COVID or a chronic illness helps us see reality as it is. And hopefully, helps us change and become more flexible, kinder to ourselves and kinder to others. So on that note, I'll turn it back to you, Michelle. Thank you very much, everyone. Oh, thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, very practical advice to take away from, from, this, um, from this webinar. Thank you so much for that. Um, I do know that traditional medical training is very achievement oriented. <laughs> uh, the, we spend five years drilling students, <laughs> achieve, achieve, you know, um, save the life. <laughs> and then now we're saying, no, we don't know, step back. So it's going to take some drilling as well. Uh, but I'm so glad we're having those conversations around self-care, around having an identity outside of medicine. Um, for health workers, because that is what's going to keep them well and even keep them in the profession uh, when they know how to look after themselves. Um, before I take, okay, now let me go ahead and uh, ask uh, from the chat box before I put mine. Um, what is the name of the book you recommended? Oh, it's, it's called Well, W-E-L-L, -L, and it's by Dr. Mary Gunn, G-U-N-N. -N. Okay, great. It's on Amazon. You can see it there. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. And then um, something Jonathan said, which resonated with um, me, is think about the help and support you can offer each other. Because COVID is such an isolating disease. Um, you know, we don't visit people in hospital. We don't visit them at home. So it almost feels like stigma. People say they feel stigmatized. They know it can't be stigma because <laughs> uh, these are their colleagues who continue going to work, but we need to provide each other. We have to have a social network outside of the professional uh, network to look after each other, right? Then 
Um, maybe this last question, if he's still with us, the last question is probably for Dr. Felix. The question is, is it possible for a person to have COVID three times? Yes, it's possible. I know of a colleague who whenever she has had COVID throughout through all waves, whenever COVID comes, she gets infected. Okay. And, uh, so it's, uh, it's possible, but uh, she's lucky that she has mild symptoms. So, she, I mean, she, she, she has never, I mean, she isolates, but apart from isolating, she, what she just says are just mi minor upper respiratory, respiratory symptoms. So it's okay. possible to get uh, COVID several times. The, the, the hopeful thing is that the antibodies that you get from the previous wave will, produce, will offer you some protection and keep those symptoms mild. So, and you always try to, to, to protect yourself, I mask mean, up and make sure you and protect yourself from getting the, the infection. But despite all that, you can still get COVID. All right, great. Thank you for that, Doc. Um, so, Maybe May I ask me... a question, Michelle? Sorry to interrupt. May I ask a yeah. question of all the presenters and the listening audience? So what do you think we need to do to improve the relationship between doctors and patients, especially around long COVID? Dr. Felix had indicated that here he was a doctor and he sometimes felt he wasn't being listened to. What do we need to do in our health professions to improve that? Can I try? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, so it comes back to our models of illness, right? Biopsychosocial. Uh, when I'm feeling radical, sometimes I even feel we should take back the power in that statement of it's all in your head. Because you know what? That mind is powerful. Everything we experience, you know, <laughs> comes from the head. It comes from the mind, right? So if we can start imagining that illness can have a psychological component and start treating illness in multidisciplinary teams. Okay. Um, long COVID is more than respiratory. It's more than, you know, cardiac or renal symptoms. It also has a psychological component that affects the patient, the practitioner as well, because they are so frustrated why the patient um, isn't responding as they would have expected. So we need multidisciplinary teams to, to manage these symptoms that are all in your head. <laughs> yeah. And to destigmatize um, psychological symptoms. People don't make up, nobody wants to suffer, right? So that acknowledgement that if they keep coming back, they are suffering. And we need to help our patients to hear them when they're asking for help in that way. And I think it's important to emphasize that it's not all in their head, that they're emotional, they have an emotional response to an inflammatory or um, autoimmune disorder. And that creates an emotional response. So they have a virus or post viral condition, and the emotions come as a result of that. So it's not that they have an emotional disorder at all. Wow. The emotions are as a result of the viral or post-viral activity. Yeah. And Dr. Rukudzwe is saying, learning to listen and validating others' feelings and emotions. Clinicians want, might want to increase their skills on how to practically listen without judgment <laughs> at the people's uh, emotions and experiences. That will also help them become better long COVID practitioners. Thank you, Rukuto. That's a very uh, important um, uh, contribution there. Um, and while we're on that, on what next? Um, we've spoken about the problem and um, I, I really should be, we all really are grateful to Jonathan, to the Amari Consortium, as well as the Post-COVID Treatment Network Africa for organizing this webinar and allowing us to share uh, our experiences of long COVID. And we look forward to your continuing support um, 
in as this disease progresses and evolves. And we have spoken about creating treatment platforms for health workers. Um, and I would like to invite Dr. Rukuzo Mwamuka to talk to us about a newly pioneered uh, treatment platform for health workers here in Zimbabwe. Dr. Rukuzo. Um, thank you, Dr. Mshato. Um, it, 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 this comes so exciting to just hear everything that Dr. Manyeruke had to say, that Vladimir had to say, what Dr. Jonathan had to, to say about, you know, the experiences of healthcare workers, not only from the perspective of being a professional, but also personal experiences about, you know, what 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 we have gone through and you know just taking off the boots of being a clinician and actually being a patient yourself sometimes is a very good lesson it helps us to all see how um we can be better patients and how we can uh, manage our patients better i work with um the friendship bench organization and uh, traditionally most of you know about the friendship bench and all the amazing work that prop dixon Shibanda has done over the years and traditionally we have um been working with grandmothers lay health workers providing basic counseling. When the COVID pandemic came on, on, you know, people were asking, is there something for healthcare workers? And uh, obviously sometimes things take long um, to happen. Eventually we managed uh, to get some funds to create um, or to start what we call an open line or a hotline, um, which is basically a phone number where you can send a message uh, to be linked up with the counselor. But based on all the things that, you know, probably you have shared and had before, healthcare workers' uh, health-seeking behavior is not always the best. Even issues to do with devolving can be difficult. Hence the idea that, you know, the open line is anonymous, um, uh, which is a plus. But at the same time, we could not use the traditional friendship age model of having lay uh, counselors. So we have um, a team of clinical psychologists who are going to be able to provide this particular service to healthcare workers. And some of them will keep joining some of these sessions so that they are able to also get some insights on you know, the issues around low COVID, you know, some of the complaints that uh, healthcare workers will come um, on board with. It is obviously something new um, that we are pioneering. It's obviously going to be an iterative process. There are going to be lots and lots of questions that have already been coming in from, you know, various people and the fears about, you know, is it really going to be anonymous? Who's going to be seeing me? Are they qualified enough? And hopefully people will gain um, a good amount of confidence for this. It might not be... Um, you know, a tailored intervention for long COVID, but we are aware that, you know, even long before COVID was there, healthcare workers still had um, lots of burnout, depression. Um, so still the needs are already existed. A few other people who have tried to look around, you know, what uh, are the problems that healthcare workers present with, still found that, you know, most of their complaints were around the social issues, you know, financial issues that they face, and might even less so uh, be about the physical symptoms that they might be um, uh, having. So the service is available. I think I did share our flyer with Biggie that Biggie can actually be able to share around and circulate. And one other thing that I found very useful is we have put together a number of tools um, and resources that people can also access, which can be circulated and are available on a specific page within the Friendship Bench website. And within those resources, one of the um, interesting things there is a journal. So, you know, practically, you know, every time people talk about, you know, I, I, I am fatigued, so how do I go back into a routine? So there is a little journal that um, 
Jean and her team have put together. Uh, it's a simple journal that somebody can actually use practically to actually start you know some of these things that we are discussing so you can you can share uh, all the resources that i've spoken about the flyer with the actual phone number and uh, a link to the website page where you can get the resources thank you wow thank you so much dr mamuka this is uh, a very needed intervention thank you so much um and i do hope that uh, health workers take you up on this offer. This is a free service? Yes, it is a free service. Okay. Um, conducted electronically, is, it, is the interface in electronic or uh, actually you come in for an appointment? Um, this is available. You can do it via WhatsApp if you would like. Um, obviously, texts can be a bit hectic for some people, but all the options are available. If you prefer a phone call, then that can be arranged with your counselor. If you also prefer a physical um, uh, session, that can be available. Of note, we have tried to have the clinical psychologist in different parts of Zimbabwe and who are able to speak all languages. So they are not only catering for, you know, doctors and nurses, but, you know, we recognize that healthcare workers um, at different levels. We even have nurse aides, we have pharmacists, like um, counselors themselves. Uh, we have physiotherapists, radiologists, everybody who's a healthcare worker would benefit um, from this service. Wow, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so there you have it, uh, our listening audience, that this is something um, that has been tailored specially for us to take care of our mental health needs. Uh, you know, if we look after ourselves, we become better at looking after, um, at looking after others. So we look forward to meeting with you, Dr. Mamuka, and receiving um, some of the healthcare you're offering. Okay. So any questions for Dr. Mamuka? We have about 30 seconds left. Okay. All right. So if there are no more questions, uh, I'd like to thank all our presenters, uh, Felix, Vladimir, and um, Jonathan for taking the time out to share with us, not only their experiences, but advice on how to manage with long COVID in ourselves and in the people we are interfacing with and treating on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we also want to again reiterate, thank you Amari, thank you the Post-COVID Treatment Network Africa for organizing this webinar and have a good, have a good afternoon. Thank you, bye-bye, thank you.